with a sunshiny smile Heard the roar of a plane as it sailed through the sky To a playmate she cried with a bright twinkling eye My daddy rides that ship in the sky Oh, my daddy rides that ship in the sky My daddy rides that ship in the sky Mama's not afraid and neither am I different instruments that resemble the banjo, that have a round head with a skin over it usually, and a neck with some strings on it. Mm -hmm. But now the banjo is used a lot by all kinds of people who like to play mountain music and bluegrass. Now here's an old mountain song, and it's real easy to sing. Shot was a mole in the ground. Oh, I was a mole. It's always fun to see if we can make up a verse to this song. All you need is an animal and the place that that animal is. Maybe what it does. Who's got an idea for an animal? Okay. Ooh. How about if I was a lion in the den? Hmm. What would I do? What would I do if I was a lion in the den? Hunt for food. I what? I bring a zebra in. Bring a zebra in. <laughs> well, the lion's got to eat, and that rhymes. He's got a good sense of rhyme. Let's do that one. I say go with that one. I wish I was a lion in the den. Oh, I wish I was a lion in the den. If I was a lion in the den, I'd bring a zebra in. I was out in the swamp and I was trapped all the day. I come back into the camp and I say to my wife, what you have fixed to eat? I am very hungry. She say, not much, view, not much. I pick up a few shrimp and a crab and with them I make a gumbo. A gumbo is a soup. Ah, chérie, I say a gumbo is very little for a man fatigued like me, a man tired like me. Why you not kill a chicken? We only have one chicken left, and she lay an egg every day. It would be a mortal sin to kill a beast like that. Just then, I hear a ah, out in the backyard. I throw open the door, I look out, 
There is a rat de bois has got our last hen by the neck. I run out in the yard, I pick up a stick, I give him a grand coup de raton. I put his feet in the air. I say to my wife, look, look, the bon Dieu is bon, the good Lord is good. Now we're gonna have meat to eat. So I take it, he hide over the Zebi. He the fur trader in the next camp. He gonna take that hide and he gonna sell it. He take that hide and he give me a bottle of wine for trade. My wife, she fix up a little bread. She fix up a stew. Everything come good. A little while later, I open the oven door to see how everything is going. Now maybe you not believe this, but I open that oven and there is the rat de bois. He's standing up in the pan. He had eat the potatoes. He had drink the grease. He come running out the door. He run between my wife's legs, knock over the bread, knock over the wine. He go running out through the door. He grab that hand and he go running off. And that's not all. That night, he go back in the Zebby's camp. He take it the hide off of the stretching board and he put it back on. Now that's something, huh? <laughs> And while he was there, he ate up the stew, and he went back to Zebby, who had his hide, and he took that hide off of the stretching board, he put it back on, and he ran off. Now, could a possum really do that? No! No, it's an exaggeration, but it's based on something true, which is that a possum plays dead. Now, we all know about recycling, maybe, how you use things in new ways, okay? Well, in the old days, when you got these big old holes in your blue jeans, like he's got, and your mama said, uh-uh, no more wearing those blue jeans, she didn't just throw those blue jeans out. She took the blue jeans and she cut out squares and shapes out of the good part of the blue jeans. She did that with all the leftovers for the clothes, and then when she got a nice big pile, she'd say, it's time to make a patchwork quilt. And she'd sew those patches together and she'd make something new out of those old things. Now, here are the motions. I want you to put on a pair of glasses for your grandma, because you know our eyes get old. On my grandma's, and probably the first place you need a patch, it's right here, because you're sitting on it all the time. So for patch, I want you to kind of hit your bottom. Patchwork, and for quilt, I want you to pretend you've got a needle and you're sewing. Okay. All my grandma's patchwork quilt. Let me see it. Squares of corduroy and silk. Then green and blue. And yellow to all my grandma's patchwork quilt. I was singing with some kids back in a little community center way back in the mountains, and it rained and poured. And when I went to drive out of there, I got to that valley, and the water was about this deep. I couldn't get through it. I was water bound. Can you sing that with me? Yeah. Water bound in a naked hole. Water bound in a naked hole. Water bound in a naked hole. Down in the line. Markets in Latin America. There's a food market. There's a market with lots of crafts, like I've got there. There's my sister-in-law and my nephews in a market in San Miguel de Allende, Mexico. And here's a song about going to the market to buy some musical instruments. There's Jose Luis Orozco. This comes from a book of his called Diez de Dios, and other play rhymes and action songs from Latin America. There'll be a guitar. There'll be a clarinet, and clarinet. There'll be a violin, and then a cello, which is pronounced violon in Spanish. And there'll be a fufu, a tambor, or a hand drum. En la pulga de San Jose, yo compré una guitarra. And then you play your guitar. Can you hold up your hands like you're playing a guitar? One hand goes out like that and the other strums. Ta da ta da ta da la di ta da. Now you guys can play too back there if you like. Ta da ta da ta da la di ta da. Then sing. 
Bayou State, Bayou State, which means you go to Bayou State, Bayou State, a la pulga de San Jose. You go to, you go to, to la pulga de San Jose. That's it. This goes under your chin. This goes up in your hand. Hold up your violin. You need a bow to play it. A stick with some horse's hair. Hold that with this hand. Lean, lean, violin. Tune, tune, el tune, tune. Lon, lon, violon. Lean, lean, violin. Nete, 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 clarinete. Tara, 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 la guitarra. Buy you stead, buy you stead. A la pulga de San Jose. Buy you stead, buy you stead. A la pulga de San Jose. The Irish eat lots of potatoes, and in the old days they used to really depend on those potatoes. And this is a story about Jamie O'Rourke and the big potato. Jamie O'Rourke was the laziest man in Ireland. He would do anything to keep from working. He would sit around all day, and his wife Eileen would say, Jamie O'Rourke, we'll have nothing to eat this winter if you don't get up and pick out the praties. To himself he says, with Eileen sick in bed, there'll be no praties. With no praties there'll be no food. With no food I'll starve to death. There's no telling how soon death will be knocking at my door. I best go and confess my sins to Father O'Malley so that I can go to heaven when I die. And so in the middle of the night, Jamie O'Rourke got up out of bed and started down the hill to the church. Well, about halfway down the hill, he heard a little singing and tapping. He come up nice and close and he pulled back the ferns and there, sitting in the middle of the moonlight, a leprechaun. Well, Jamie knew just what to do. He grabbed that fella by the coattails and held him up in the air. Let me go! Let me go! said the little fella. Not on your life, said Jamie. Not until you take me to your pot of gold. Oh, Mr. Martelman, he says. I'm just starting out in the train. I've only got two pieces of gold. Won't you take a wish instead? A wish? And what would I be wishing for, says Jamie, me whose wife is sick in bed and can't get up and I'm about to starve to death. Mm -hmm. Well, when Jamie O'Rourke got home and told Eileen what he had done, she says, Jamie O'Rourke, you're not only the laziest man in Ireland, but you're a fool as well. What are you going to do with this so-called magic potato seed? You'll see, says Jamie, I'll plant it, and you'll see. She did see, for in a few weeks, up out of the ground came an enormous potato. Fifty years ago in Ireland, the potatoes got a disease called the blight. It came across the ocean on the ships, and all their potatoes turned bad. You couldn't eat them. It spread like wildfire across the Irish countryside. If you read Nori Ryan's song by Patricia Riley Giff, as in many cases with a historical novel, you kind of get an, an inside feel for it. She discovers it one day when she hears this scream across the fields, and then she smells this stench coming toward her. The very next day, she discovers it in her own garden. When she walks through the garden, this brown ooze comes out on her skirt. And after a while, what most of them had to do because they were starving to death is go to America. What made it worse was that the English people in the country next door owned almost all the homes. And when they couldn't earn any money, they were kicking them out of the homes. So they didn't have any home, they didn't have any food, and things got worse and worse. And so what a million of them did was they boarded a ship and they came to the United States. It was not a comfortable ride on that ship. They were stuck way down below. 
had a miserable time. Finally, they arrived in the United States and they looked for work. And what many of them did for work was they helped to build the railroads which were coming across the United States at that time. And they had a work song that they loved to sing called Patty on the Railroad. It's got a great chorus. Riches on, I put me corduroy riches on to work upon the railway. Fill a me, ori, ori, fill a me, ori, ori, fill a me, ori, ori, to work upon the railway. That's your point. Ori, fill a me, ori, ori, fill a me, ori, ori, to work upon. Through the mountain, what they would do is they would have a drill, and John Henry would hit that drill, and then the shaker would twist it so it dug into the into the rock. He'd hit it again, they twist it again, hit it, twist it, hit it, twist it, till they had a big enough place where they could put a stick of dynamite, and then they would blow up a little more of the rock and start day, all over again. The owner of the of the company brought a steam drill around. These were real machines that they invented to do the work and they said it could do the work of 10 men. Well, if it could do the work of 10 men, then nine of those men would be out of a job. So the legend says that John Henry raced that steam drill to see who could go further through the mountain in the same amount of time. Well, the captain who said to John Henry, he gonna bring me a steam drill around. I'm gonna bring that steam drill Said a man ain't nothing but a man. But before I let your old skin you'll beat me down, you know I'll die with a hammer in my hand. Lord, Lord, I'll die with a hammer in my hand. Okay. Now, most moms the equivalent of a church don't look like that. That's a big and beautiful one in the capital of Turkey, Istanbul. And it just happens that the first story I'm going to tell you comes from that country of Turkey. It's one of many, many stories told about a man who really lived, whose name was Nasreddin. Hoja wasn't really his last name. Hoja means teacher. He was considered a teacher. But he taught in a very odd way. Many of the stories that people have been telling ever since show him sometimes acting very foolish, and other times he acts very wise. And sometimes there's kind of a mix of the two. One time, the Hoja was invited to a banquet at the home of the Mokhtar, a very important man in his village. Now, the Hoja was considered a wise man, not Sridi village. And he loved to eat. So being invited to a banquet was perfect. All day long as he was working in the garden, he was thinking, ah, all that delicious food. As I'm eating that food, people will be asking my opinion about all kinds of interesting things. It will be great. All day long he was thinking about that as he was working in the garden, and he was thinking so hard that he didn't pay attention to the time. And he discovered when he had finished and he went home that if he wanted to bathe and he wanted to dress up in his fine clothes, he was going to be late for the banquet. He didn't want to do that. So he went on to the banquet in his work clothes with dirt on his clothes and dirt on his hands, dirt on his face. And when he walked into the banquet, even though he was sure that the Mukhtar recognized him, the Mukhtar didn't pay him any attention. In fact, nobody did. And they seated him at the end of a long table in the back of the hall. And when the food finally came down to his end of the table, 
There was nothing left. So the Hoja, with his stomach empty and his feelings hurt, slipped out of the banquet and he went back home. When he got home, he bathed himself completely and then he put on his finest clothes. He put on an elegant shirt and baggy pants and a great big turban. And on top of it all, he put on his new fur coat. Well, this time, when he got to the banquet, the Mukhtar rose to meet him. And the servant took him and seated him right there beside the Mukhtar in the place of honor. The servants brought him tray after tray of delicious food. And he would take the foods and people were asking him questions. But as he took the food, he didn't eat it. He started stuffing it into the pockets of his coat. And when he ran out of room in the pockets, he started rubbing it into his shirt. He was rubbing it all over his shirt. The kids thought it was funny, you know. Here he was, the wise man in town. He was rubbing food in his shirt. But the Mukhtar was kind of embarrassed. And he watched him for a while. And finally, he said, Hoja, he said, what are you doing? Have you lost your mind? No, said the Hoja. I haven't lost my mind. I'm just trying to teach you a little lesson. You see, when I came here earlier dressed in my work clothes, you barely acknowledged me and you seated me in a corner, way back in the corner of the hall, where there was no food left for me and really no one to talk to. When I came back dressed in these elegant clothes, you treated me as the guest of honor. I haven't changed. I'm the same person who came here before. It's only my clothes that have changed. So, it must be my clothes that you're honoring. Out of respect, I'm feeding them first. <laughs> Eat my clothes, he said. You are the guest of honor. And with that, he stood up. Wonderful, wonderful world. It could be a wonderful. 